Good morning, fifth grade. So we just finished up chapter three. So we're gonna go on and move on to chapter four. Um, in chapter four, our overall is the road to war. So let's go ahead and read to find out what war we're gonna talk about here. All right, so it says, why would a nation want to become independent? So if you think about that, think about what, what war do you think is going to come up that's going to help a nation become independent, our nation become independent? Why don't you think about that? All right, so let's look at lesson one. You're going to read about the French and Indian War. Lesson two, we're going to talk about the Patriots, the Loyalists, and the British. In lesson three, we're going to talk about how the colonists rebel. And then afterwards, we're going to look at the impact today and the governor's role in the economy. So let's go ahead and continue on with why would a nation want to become independent? So this is our essential question for the whole chapter. It's just our big idea. So we got to be thinking about that. So it says, in this chapter, you'll read about the conflicts that arose between the American colonies and Great Britain. You'll learn about how the colonists were divided between wanting independence and wanting reconciliation with Great Britain. And you'll discover what ultimately led them down the road to war. That word reconciliation, okay, that means like wanting to make up, wanting to become friends again, like wanting to fix or mend what was wrong. So let's go ahead and look at our timeline um, for our chapter here. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in just a little bit more here. All right, so we have the Americas and then we have world events. So these are things that are happening in the Americas and then things are happening throughout the world at this time. So looking at those two different sections of um, this timeline here. So let's start off in 1735. We have Quan Long becomes emperor of China. In 1736, we have Safavid Empire ends in Persia, which is modern day Iran. In 1740 to 1741, we have cold weather and poor harvests kill more than a third of the population in Ireland. And that was, I think, the Great Potato Famine. Um, and then we have in 1754, we have the French and Indian War begins. Moving on to 1760, we have George III becomes ruler of Great Britain. In 1763, we have the Treaty of Paris ends, the French and Indian War. And then in 1763, again, we have the Proclamation of 1763, that sets aside land west of the Appalachian Mountains for the Native Americans. Continue with our timeline on the next page. Um, in 1765, we have Parliament passes the Stamp Act and the Quartering Act. We'll get more information about those. Um, in 1767, we have Parliament passes the Townsend Acts. Now this is in the world here, not in the Americas, but world events. We have in 1769 to 1770, we have British Captain James Cook explores Australia and New Zealand, back up to the Americas, so in 1772. Samuel Adams forms the first Committee of Correspondence. 1773, we have colonists protest the Tea Act with the Boston Tea Party. And then in 1774, in the Americas, we have the first Continental Congress meets. And then world, we have... Joseph Priestley of Great Britain becomes the first scientist to publish a description of the chemical element oxygen. Let's go ahead and take a look at our map here. Um, it says North America after the French and Indian War. So this is in 1763. So this is after the French and Indian War. If you remember, um, we looked at a map earlier in last or in chapter three. We talked about how most of this land here was the French land. Okay, so now let's look at these colors and look at all this red here. Okay, all this red is what now are lands that belong to the British. Okay, and then the striped green are former French lands. So look at how much land that the British took from the French in the French and Indian War. All right, and then we have our Spanish lands again here, so all in orange. And then um, the proclamation line of 1763. We talked about that, how everything um, west of this proclamation line was set aside for the Native Americans. 
All right, that was the original plan. The Native Americans could live anywhere past this line, anywhere to the west over here. So it says, what areas were under French control before the French and Indian Wars? We kind of talked about that. And then what happened to that territory as a result of the French and Indian War? Well, we said that they pretty much lost that territory and the British took over. Okay, so at the beginning of every chapter, we have a connect through literature um, feature. And so this one is an excerpt from Duel in the Wilderness. So it's just a part of a, um, a story by Karen Clayford Farley. So it says, Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia summons a young George Washington to the Capitol building in Williamsburg to discuss an important mission to the Ohio River Valley. George stood at attention while the secretary introduced him. Then, extending his right leg forward, as was the custom, he bowed deeply to the governor and the council members. Robert Dinwiddie, the Royal Lieutenant Governor, sat in a carved wood and cane armchair topped with a crown at the end, at the far end of a large oval table. The table itself was covered with a brightly woven turkey carpet littered with quill pens, ink wells, and papers. Only eight members of the 12 member council were present. They sat in identical chairs, except for the crown on either side of the table. George stood alone at the open end. No one smiled or attempted to put George at ease, not even his friend, Colonel William Fairfax. George fixed his eyes on the governor and they never wavered. His muscles never twitched. His mouth set in a firm thin line never quivered except once. As George looked at the governor, he could not help seeing himself as a fat, melting candle. His face drooped down onto his double chins, which met his fallen chest, which had slipped onto his overhanging stomach. George felt one corner of his mouth curve up as he fought back a grin. In spite of his appearance, Robert Dinwiddie was no fool. His sharp blue eyes narrowed, almost disappearing into his fat face as he studied the young man before him. Major Washington, I have informed the council members of your offer to act as a diplomatic messenger to carry a letter to the French commander and learn by what right he has come into his majesty's lands beyond the Allegheny Mountains on the River Ohio, he said in a thick Scottish accent. Before Governor Dinwiddie could say more, one of the elder, elderly council members struggled to his feet. Your honor, I must protest. When you said the major here was a younger brother of the late Major Lawrence Washington, I did not realize how much younger. Why, he is but a boy. How can you think of sending him on such a delicate mission to the French? We need a man of experience, mature judgment. I'll wager he has not yet, yet reached his major majority. He would have to ask his mother's permission to go. Laughter broke out around the table. Burning under such cruel joking at his expense, George felt his control over his fiery temper slip away from him, and he did not care. Anger flashed in his eyes. He knew he should not speak while standing at attention, but the words were out before he could stop them. I turned 21 earlier this year, sir. His protest went unheeded as another counselor joined in. Your honor, I agree. I did not realize when we confirmed your appointment of Mr. Washington re to replace his late brother as adjuant that he was not the nearer in age and experience to the three other adjuants of the Dominion's militia. This time, George caught a shake of the head and a warning look from his friend. Colonel William Fairfax. He struggled to control his temper by clamping his teeth over the inside of his lower lip until he tasted blood. Robert Dinwiddie answered their protest. Gentlemen, you know I have offered this mission to several other, older, more qualified men. 
They have all found reasons to decline it. The major here is a military man. We need a military man to spy uh, or assess the French buildup of forces in Ohio country. Colonel Fairfax interrupted. Gentlemen, I have known Major Washington for many years. His brother Lawrence was my son-in-law. George is like a second son to me. Since the age of 15, he has earned his own way as a licensed surveyor for this colony and has a reputation of being one of the most skillful. He has traveled many times to the frontier in the course of his work. He is used to the hard outdoors life, but he has never crossed the mountains to Logstown or Murdering Town, someone shouted out. I'll show you this picture really quickly. This is, this is the council room inside the Virginia Capitol building in Williamsburg. Colonel Fairfax answered by asking his own question, who has crossed the mountains? This is a dark and mysterious land to us. The Indian tribes have allowed some traders in, men who are useful to them. Sometimes we have coaxed a few of the Indians to the edge of the wilderness to give them presents, to assure them that we are their brothers. But no high official of the government has gone beyond the mountains, not from this colony, nor any other that I know of. Now, this fine young man, one of our own Virginia militia ad adjuants, has volunteered to undertake this critical task. And you question, sir? Could you endure the hardships of such a journey, sir? Certainly I could not. His youth is what recommends him most, and I say we engage him. But the counselor was not to be put off. Last year, his honor tried to send a letter to the French by trader William Trent, a man of long experience in the wilderness. Even Trent was afraid to go north of Logstown toward Lake Erie, where the French are known to be. Traders have been taken prisoner or killed, their goods taken and their, themselves sent to a goal in Canada. Every day, more Indians ally themselves to the French, who rewarded them for killing Englishmen. If Major Washington is like a son to you, how can you suggest he make a journey from which he has so little hope of returning? A gull in, gull in cold Canada? The very thought made George shiver. No, no, he told himself. He would be a diplomat, not a traitor. English traitors might be imprisoned, but not diplomats. At this very moment, William Keppel, Earl of Alba Maria, in, and the official royal governor of Virginia was the English ambassador to the French court. Yet he could not take such heart about the Indians being rewarded for killing Englishmen. A vivid memory crowded his mind. He was on a surveying trip on the upper Potomac River and he stopped for the night at Trader Thomas's Crespin outpost. While there, he met an Iroquois war party friendly to Cresset returning up the warrior's path from a raid on the Cherokees. All night long, they danced to their pounding drums and the rattle of gourds. Five years had passed, but George could feel his excitement as if it were just yesterday. Colonel Fairfax continued to speak to the council. I have great trust in Major Washington, as does my esteemed cousin, Lord Fairfax. Major Washington is a great favorite of his lordships. At the mention of Thomas Lord Fairfax, to whose grandfather King Charles I had granted the largest tract of land in Virginia, the entire Shenandoah Valley, all discussion among the council members abruptly ended. His lordship rarely left Greenwood, his estate in the remote Shenandoah Valley but he made his power as the wealthiest man and the highest ranking nobleman in the colony felt through his kinsman, Colonel William Fairfax. Governor Dinwiddie drew attention back to himself. He did not look at the council members. Instead, he studied George intently. Just so there's no misunderstanding, do you know what I am asking? George made no effort to reply. His eyes remained fixed on the governor's face, and he tried not to blink. 
To deliver this letter would send the king's name you would have to cross the Alleghenies to Venanago or heaven's knows where to find the French commander. You would be gone at least a month, for there are no roads between Winchester, as you know. Snow and rain will be coming to the high country, and if you do make contact with the French, they no doubt will smile in your face, shrug their shoulders in that confounded Gaelic way they have, send me a charming letter in return, and have one of their agents put a knife in your back some dark night. That is the mission we speak of. Do you still wish to volunteer? George could feel the eyes of Queen Anne boring into his back from her portrait hanging on the wall behind him. I am ready, sir, to serve faithfully my king and my country in any way I can. So looking at this picture here, this is actually a map that Washington drew um, during his mission to the Ohio River Valley. So this is his map, and they said in, earlier in the passage that he was a surveyor, and a surveyor, if you remember, was somebody that went out, looked at the land, and then drew maps and kind of guided out where everything was. All right, so let's look at some questions um, that we need to think about a little bit during this um, passage that we read. So it says, why are the council members unsure about Washington at the beginning? So if we look back and we remember this, let me go ahead and, and phase back to it. When you look at this first, this paragraph on this first page, I'm going to reread. It says, before Governor Dinwiddie could say more, one of the elderly council members struggled to his feet. He said, your honor, I must protest. When you said the major here was a younger brother of late Major Lawrence Washington, I did not realize how much younger. Why, he is but a boy. How can you think of send, sending him on such a delicate mission to the French? He says, we need a man of experience, mature judgment. I'll wager he has not yet reached his majority. So why then were these council members unsure about George Washington? Because he, they thought that he was too young. He says, by, why, but he was but a boy. Okay, they said, he's too young. He can't handle this. So chapter four, as in every other chapter we've had so far, we have some people you should know, um, some people of this time period and that may have made an impact. So we have James Logan. And I'm going to go ahead and kind of make this a little larger so we can read it. The son of Chief Shikalami of the Oneida people, James Logan was a respected figure in the Pennsylvania colony. His good relationship with the white settlers in the area of the Ohio River Valley lasted until 1774. At that time, a traitor murdered Logan's family during the Yellow Creek Massacre. This treachery sparked the conflict that came to be called Lord Dunmore's War between the Native Americans and the European settlers. Later, he helped the British and Army during the American Revolution. Then over here, we have Sarah Bradley Fulton. There's a painting of her there. And she was called the mother of the Boston Tea Party. Sarah Bradley Fulton used her own kitchen as a meeting place for the men who dumped tea into Boston Harbor on December 16th of 1773. She and the other Daughters of Liberty showed similar resistance to the British throughout the revolution that was to come. She organized women to nurse wounded soldiers after the Battle of Bunker Hill and acted as a courier, crossing enemy lines and risking her own life during the Revolutionary War. Okay, the next person we have here is William Pitt the Elder, and he is a British leader. William Pitt was a mastermind of Great Britain's strategy in the Seven Years' War, which included the French and Indian War. Pitt convinced Parliament to put him in charge to give him almost unlimited resources and to let him completely restructure the British military in order to win the conflict. His strategies worked and Great Britain won the war. They also left Britain with the tremendous debt that Britain wanted the colonists to help pay for. Later, Pitt spoke out against Britons taxing the colonists without allowing them to be represented in Parliament. 
Okay, and so lastly on here, we have Chief Pontiac. A chief of the Ottawa people of the Great Lakes region, Pontiac forged an alliance to beat back the British in the conflict known as Pontiac's War at 1763 to 1766. His alliance included almost all of the Native American tribes between Lake Superior and the Lower Mississippi. His strategy was fairly successful at first, but years of fighting took their toll, and Pontiac signed a peace treaty with the British in 1766.